Welcome everybody to the Mystery School Podcast, where hopefully you'll learn all about the Mystery Schools, the secret societies, and those who rule you through their agents, their media-made men, and hopefully this will somewhat continue um, and continue to push and um, rediscover the work of <clears throat> one Bill Cooper, a conspiracy theorist, I guess, originally a ufologist, which you know that always raises eyebrows and uh, immediately puts somebody into the crazy category, which of course, the second I learned that one topic was a ufologist, it crushed me. But then you look into, uh, well, actually, it was when I first started looking about him, and, um, you know, it didn't take long before. You hear the fact that, well, yeah, once over he did believe in this stuff because of things that he was um, sort of pretty to in the U.S. Navy as an intelligence officer. Um, and eventually realised that those were lies told to him by the Navy, by the higher-ups in the Navy to him, which led him into a life of uncovering the corruption, um, leading up to, I mean, eventually things like the Illuminati and all of their arms, all of the tentacles that filter into all sorts of other things, including the thing that we will be talking about today. Um, I've been reading something called The Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, sorry, from the Executive Intelligence Review entitled The Ugly Truth About the ADL and Dope Inc. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know about the ADL, it's sort of a Jewish lobbyist thing in the United States, but it's got ties with the you know, Freemasonry, secret societies, and it's used uh, politically as a way to... Um, basically manipulate uh, opinion. They're constantly calling people racist or anti-Semitic and, you know, it's a lobbyist group. It's like Al Sharpton or anything like that. It's they, they have ridiculous power because a tiny minority of loud voices scare the shit out of people who will just bend the knee and apologise and put money in their pockets. But they're a lot more sinister than that as well. As you'll see, they have their roots in all sorts of just the, the the from everything from the Civil War way back. Originally, all of this stuff comes right out of the Illuminati. Um, it's various various wings. It's uh, the lodges of the uh, Scot of the Scottish right of um, Freemasonry. Basically, set this up. The British intelligence, the whole when they realised that they had lost the United States. Now there's so even when I'm saying this, there's so many layers of this because I'm about to paint you a long story that won't really get to the fact that. I mean, in a way, it sort of makes it look as if the founding fathers were all unanimously these good men that broke away from the Illuminati. But as a lot of you will know, um. George Washington set up the first, um, what was it? I can't remember, it was, uh, <laughs> I, I get all this shit in my head, it gets uh, mixed up. I can't remember whether it was George Washington or whether it was Benjamin Franklin. But they were both Freemasons anyway. Um, Franklin, by the way, in um, 1731, was initiated in uh, uh, Masonic Lodges. And he became a Grand Master in 1734. Um, as he rose to prominence in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, in the same year, he edited and published the first Masonic book of the Americas, a reprint of James Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons. And, um, of course, Benjamin Franklin remained a Mason for the rest of his life. But, yeah, so you get into this, and the, the thing that I'm about to talk about is going to sort of paint it as if it's, you know, oh, it's just British intelligence, and of course it's all British in the end. 
that's where the Americans come from. Um, unfortunately, the, the sickness followed them over. Uh, and it would have inevitably anyway. There was no way they were going to let the continent go. And they realised once they couldn't do it by gun, well, you just do it like everything else. You just set your British agents up, manipulate them into positions of power with enormous like m monetary, um, and just through things like through secret societies, which back in the day, like they're they're powerful now. But there are, there are complications, like back in the day when you had like a secret society and you had like secret handshakes and shit like that, there, aren't, there isn't an FBI or a CIA investigating this stuff. <laughs> Do you understand? Like this stuff will just go completely unknown for perhaps hundreds of years. Outside the people that have some relation with it for whatever reason. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to get across the perspective or the context of like certain eras or times when you talk about stuff like this or the or even the things in other genres like the um, effectiveness of propaganda before media wasn't twitter where where not everyone was a news source when well, once over only people who were put into certain positions could get across the alleged facts and everyone just bought them as facts although then again you know you look into history and You'll realize that people are always kind of suspicious. But anyway, folks, tonight I'm going to embark on a course from which there is no return. It is important that you learn the information that I'm going to begin to impart to you tonight. And yes, this is part of the Mind Control series. Ooh. It is also part of the history of the Illuminati in the United States. And I'll explain an awful lot of things to you that have never been explained before. It's going to explain to you the link between the lodges of the Illuminati, the intelligence community and the underworld. It is extremely dangerous what I'm embarking upon. Simply because there are so many people who have attempted to reveal the history and have previously and have been killed in the process doing it. Luckily though, nobody will ever hear this. <laughs> and it will be unlistened to forever circling around the internet with 20 views. Plus, a lot of this information that I'm reading right now, although true and relevant and extremely interesting, and um, helpful still is actually from around about 1994. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter because it's a it's a history lesson, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I have no fear, and I will finish what I start, or someone else will. Because it needs to be done. Tonight I begin to narrate to you a special report of the Executive Intelligence Review entitled The Ugly Truth About the ADL. Now I want you to understand something. I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about a branch of the Illuminati. The, uh, the control structure that is bringing in this one world government. Destroying the sovereignty of nations and many, many other things. As you'll see, ladies and gentlemen, the ADL does not represent the Jewish people, but instead is using them and is manipulating them so that they innocently, as many of you have done throughout your life, innocently, are helping to bring about the destruction of the sovereignty of individual nations. The destruction of the individual creator endowed constitutionally granted rights and the formation of the one world totalitarian socialist government. 
I want it clearly understood that the hour of the time, Bill Cooper's podcast, uh, or radio show rather, has stated on many, many occasions that it and I oppose racism of any kind, in any form, by anyone. What you're going to discover is that the ADL, while calling many, many people anti-Semitic, are themselves one of the greatest racist groups that has ever existed upon the face of this earth. On April 14th, 1865, the day Abraham Lincoln was shot, they will live forever, ladies and gentlemen, as a day of infamy for patriots in America and lovers of freedom all over the world. But for the leadership of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and the Order, Bene Berith. And its 20th century police arm, the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, April 14th, 1865, is a day that will long be remembered for a very different reason. The Bene Brith, a pivotal player in the British Freemasonic plot to destroy the Union, was implicated in Lincoln's assassination. Something that I'm betting you've never been taught. The fact does not square very well with its long cultivated but totally unwarranted reputation as a Jewish sh social service organization and a champion of civil rights. For that reason, B'nai B'rith and the ADL have gone to great lengths, ladies and gentlemen, to bury that history and much, much more. Simon Wolfe, 1835 to 1923, was the Washington DC lawyer of the Order of B'nai B'rith during the entire period of the United States Civil War. He would later head the International Order of the B'nai B'rith for many years. In 1862, Wolfe was arrested by Lafayette C. Baker chief detective of the city of Washington DC and later Lincoln's chief of the United States Sec uh, Secret Service and Wolf was arrested on charges that he was involved in spying and blockade running on behalf of the Confederacy. Baker arrested Wolf who was uh, the attorney representing a number of Jews accused of spying for the South, on the grounds that he was part of a conspiratorial organization working on behalf of the secessionist cause behind the lines in the nation's capital. The conspiratorial organization named by Baker was the Bene Berith. Both Baker and the United States General Ulysses S. Grant target the order of the Bene Berith as a Confederate spy agency. Upon taking command of the Western Front in 1862, General Grant issued Order No. 11, which expelled all Jews from the military district within 24 hours of its implementation. U.S. Grant was no anti-Semite, ladies and gentlemen. He was reacting to the activities of the Bene B'rith and leading Confederates like Judah P. Benjamin. And you see, this is the Jews are thrown to the wolves throughout history constantly. You hear about Hamas hiding behind children and building their structures and schools above bomb, like um, you know, uh, chemical weapons um, installations or whatever. That is what these people do. They hide behind the Jewish people whom now you can't criticize, whom now any attack uh, upon, uh, or any accusations of um, you know, money monopolization within them, um, conspiring together, is immediately 
drawn into conclusions with what Adolf Hitler did, uh, concentration camps, which again, you know, you can say it about white people, the, the old uh, white-haired, old white guy in power, the western white politician, who of course are like 80% Jews, but um, exactly, they hide behind Jews, they set up all these things, um, like the Anti-Defamation League, specifically, you can't really criticize something that's supposed to be uh, like helping with Jewish social services and stuff like that. It's all just a big game so that they can't be on the wrong. They can't be in the wrong. They do it right now with the in these days with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and all that. It's the same thing. Black people are the new Jews. So yeah, Lincoln, however, co cognizant of the need to avoid blanket attacks against religious or ethnic groups, rescinded the order, which was the proper thing to do, for all Jews are not members of the B'nai B'rith. And B'nai B'rith was not solely at guilt. The Civil War was actually engineered and brought about by British intelligence through their arm of the Illuminati in the United States, headed by Albert Pike, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, whose headquarters at the time was in Charleston, South Carolina. In, 18, sorry, in 1987, uh, B'nai author authorized biography of Simon Wolfe by Esther L. Panitz offered the following highly suggestive of it incomplete description of Wolfe's personal relationship with President Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. Now bear in mind, folks, that this biography, written on the basis of the B'nai B'rith's archives, um, written on the basis of B'nai B'rith's own archives, paints Wolfe in the most favourable of lights. The mere fact that the author had to include Wolfe's links to, the, to Booth and Wolfe's earlier arrest as an alleged Confederate spy and blockade runner implies that the actual story is far uglier. Um, I quote from the history of the B'nai B'rith. Wolf's concern for culture first expressed itself in the formation of a private club devoted to the arts and humanities and frequented by young men avid for learning. Where pride and ambition, his, sorry, where pride and ambition, his only motives in seeking the intellectual life, clearly Wolf hoped that if he and his friends would devote themselves to the pursuit of learning, they would deflect the prejudice, uh, yeah, the prejudice statements of their Christian neighbours. Wolf was upset that the terms such as money changers, cotton traders and clothes, uh, clothes, clothes dealers had become words of reproach. Locally, the group's theatrical productions received good press. Wolf, who would often play the ghost in Hamlet or Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, bore an uncanny resemblance to John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin. Earlier in Cleveland, Booth had joined Wolf and... Oof, Piotr, I think, in dramatic performances. Years afterwards, Wolfe remembered that he had met Booth once again at the Willard Hotel on the morning of uh, the day that Lincoln was shot. There at the bar, Booth explained that Senator John P. Hale's daughter had just rejected his marriage proposal. Wolfe attributed Lincoln's murder to this personal tragedy in Booth's own life. Wolfe also recalled that once he sat for a picture entitled The Assassination, of President Lincoln. In his own book, ladies and gentlemen, entitled Presidents I Have Known, Wolf says that he and his longtime acquaintance, John Wilkes Booth, did some drinking together at the Willard Hotel on the day Booth shot Lincoln. Wolf's, Wolf's and the second leading uh, B'nai B'rith's figure, Benjamin Piotr's, dealings with John Wilkes Booth were hardly cultural. Nor could Wolford possibly believe that Abraham Lincoln was killed because John Wilkes Booth's unrequited love affair. 
Even John Hinckley, the would-be assassin of Ronald Reagan, was declared insane when he tried to peddle the line that he had tried to kill Ronald Reagan due to an unfulfilled fantasy love affair with actress Jodie Foster. To understand the circumstances under which Bene Brith's Washington DC leader and one of its founding members were circumstantially tied to the Lincoln assassination conspiracy and explicitly linked to the secessionist insurrection against the Union, it is necessary to look briefly at the circumstances under which the Order of the Bene Brith was founded in 1843. Following the American Revolution, the British monarchy and its East India Company colonists apparatus never for a moment abandoned their commitment to reconquer the lost colonies of North America. Although the military efforts at a reconquest in the War of 1812 failed, other efforts to cede the United States with British agents some drawn from the ranks of the anti-republican Tories who were permitted to retain their citizenship and property in America under the terms of the Treaty of Paris of 1783. These attempts with these British agents were far more successful than the attempts by Saud. In 1801 the Tory faction of the United States Freemasonry the grouping of Freemasons who had sided with England during the American Revolution opened up shop as the Grand Council of the Princes of Jerusalem of the Mother Supreme Council of the Knights Commander of the House of the Temple of Solomon of the 33 degree of the Ancients and Accepted Order of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States. Their official title. The United States based British Freemasonic Lodge was chartered in Charleston, South Carolina. The members of the British-led secret society would direct the Confederate secessionist insurrection a half century later and the other Scottish Rite members would be among the founders of the Bene Berith. They too would be leading Confederates. Apart from the esoteric mission of spreading an explicitly anti-Christian form of Roman pagan worship and occultism among the early generations of American citizens, the Charleston Lodge also sought to build up a network of pro-British merchants, spies and politicians in both the North and the South who would one day play a pivotal role in the reconquest. Many of these early Masons became wealthy through their business dealings with the British East India Company and the Dutch West India Company in both cotton and the slave trade. Among the founding members of the Charleston Scottish Rite Lodge were many prominent Jews including Isaac da Costa, Moses Cohen, Israel Delabin, or Deli, Deli Bin, Del, Deli Ben, uh, Dr. Isaac Held, Moses Levi and Moses Piotto. Many of these men, ladies and gentlemen, were uh, Sephardic Jews from North Africa or Spain who had originally settled in the Caribbean and engaged in the early slave trade. These Jewish Masons set up their organizations which also maintained active liaisons uh, to Brit Great Britain's powerful Jewish community. The Hebrew Orphan Aid Society was one such no uh, nominally benign group that would produce one of the most rabid secessionist leaders, Judah P. Benjamin. Although today any reports of the Freemasonic roots of the and structure of Bene Brith are usually greeted with a tolerant or uh, sorry, a torrent of allegations of anti Semitism, back in its formative years, Bene Brith's own magazine, The Menorah, offered the following information about the founders of the group 
and listen to this very carefully. Quote, Their reunions were frequent and several of them being members of existing benevolent societies, especially the Order of Freemasons and Odd Fellows, they finally concluded that somewhat similar organization but based upon the Jewish idea would best obtain their object. Continuing the quote here, the Jewish religion has many uh, observances and customs corresponding to the secret societies known to us. The synagogue, for instance, might be compared to the lodge room. It used to be open twice a day. For a Jew desiring to find a friend, they had only but go there and make themselves known by a certain sign and token. The sign consists of a grip with a full hand and the magical word Shalom Alachem. The menorah uh, sorry, mezuzah on the doorstep was the countersign um, Shema Israel. Here or Israel was the password. Indeed, to this day, all local chapters of the Bnei Berith are referred to as lodges. The practice borrowed whole cloth from the Scottish rite of Freemasonry. When Moses saw some Jews of the Bnei Berith type who tried to make the religion into a pagan secret society, he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it into powder. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and made them gods of gold. The majority of Jews in America during the first generation following independence were opposed to the idea of Jewish Freemasonic secret society. Most Jews are ordinary people, of course, like all of you listening, and don't know anything more about what's going on in the world than you do. They are lied to just like you are lied to. They are deceived just like you are deceived. And they are easily manipulated because throughout the history of the world they have been chosen as the scapegoats, as the enemy. Because of that, they can be easily led by organizations such as the Bnei Berith and the Anti-Defamation League. Israel Joseph Benjamin, a noted European Jew in his memoirs, Three Years in America, 1859-62, wrote of the Bnei Berith that, and I quote, this is a secret society like the Freemasons with passwords and the like, and it was quite a new phenomenon for me. Still, I think the existence of such a society not at all necessary. He was right, ladies and gentlemen. The secret agenda of the Bnei Berith, like that of the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite, was to destroy the Union and pave the way for reconquest. Dilton McGall one world totalitarian socialist government. You see, Bnei Berith is not the synagogue. Bnei Berith is not Jews. Bnei Berith is not Judaism. Bnei Berith is just another organ under a different name of the ages old Illuminati who practice the ancient mystery religion of Babylon in secret. They call themselves the Great White Brotherhood the Brotherhood of Man, the Illumined Ones, and if you've ever listened to Bill Cooper's series on Mystery Babylon, you know all the rest. Um, two leading B'nai B'rith allied figures would serve as exa uh, exemplars of the strategy for permanently dividing the Union. One was Judah P. Benjamin and the other August Belmont. Benjamin, who lived from 1811 to 1884, was born in the British West Indies to Sephardic Jewish parents who moved to Charleston, South Carolina in 1827. He was inducted into the Charleston Hebrew Orphan Aid Society, one of the little offsprouts of Ben Abrith. After attending Yale College in New Haven, Connecticut, he was forced to drop out under a cloud of scandal. Benjamin surfaced in New Orleans, where he quickly won the, uh, the patronage, patronage of John Siddell. S uh, Slidell, a United States Senator 
who would later play a pivotal role in the Confederacy and sponsored the career of Auguste Belmont, Belmont who married Slidell's daughter. All this interbreeding going on again. This is how it works. With Slidell's assistance, Benjamin became a prominent attorney, even serving for a period of time as the United States Attorney for New Orleans. Benjamin gained notor notoriety for covering up the gr growing terrorist activities of the Scottish Rite sponsored Knights of the Golden Circle. Okay, Benjamin gained n uh, notoriety for covering up the growing terrorist activities of the Scottish Rite sponsored Knights of the Golden Circle. Remember that. In 1852, Benjamin was elected United States Senator, a post he retained until the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, when he resigned to serve the Confederacy. Benjamin was the first Confederate Attorney General. He later served as the Secretary of War and Secretary of State, ultimately running the Confederate's uh, Secret Service on behalf of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And, as Mossad does today, he used innocent Jews in the North who were opposed by the dissolution of the Union to furnish information to the intelligence arm of the Confederacy. Judah Benjamin escaped to England following the defeat of the Confederate secessionist plot. It was Benjamin's Confederate Secret Service which organized and supervised such figures in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln as John Wilkes Booth and his accomplice John Serrett. Or Serrat, I don't know. Uh, Benjamin was charged with sedition for the Lincoln assassination, although he was never brought to trial due to his protected status in England. With the help of a leading Rothschild political asset in England, Baron Pollock, Benjamin continued his legal career in London. He, will n he never abandoned his commitment so to subvert and destroy the American Republic. However, as a wealthy lawyer for the British merchant oligarchs, Judah Benjamin collaborated with other exiled Confederate and Masonic strategists in England, such as James D. Bollock and Robert Toombs, who, by the way, just a bit of uh, trivia for you right here, Robert Toombs, great-grandfather of Rowdy, Roddy, Piper. That's correct. Um, it's true, that. So Rowdy, Roddy, Piper has illumined members in his family. Um, but that's not... Uh, Surprise, considering when you watch WWE, there's pyramids and fucking symbolism everywhere, and constant just thought the phrases that just scream from, um, scream out that they're specifically from, like Masonic um, texts, like phrases like a new day. Um, where am I now? I literally forgot what I was just talking about. Oh, Robert Toombs, wasn't it? Rowdy Rowdy Piper guy. Yeah, so, anyway. Benjamin's continuing preoccupation with the defeating um, reconstruction is indicated in letters he wrote back in the United States with complaints such as these. Yeah. And I quote, I have always looked with the utmost dread and distrust on the experiment of eman emancipation so suddenly enforced on the south by the event of the war. God knows how it will end. I know it'll end. Yo, what's up, man? Bum, 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 bum. Well, now it'll end. NWA, bitch. That's how it ends. Trey Bone! Justice! Um. <laughs> Sorry, I, I forgot that I was on this podcast for a second. I thought this was my other podcast for a second there. Uh, never mind that. And then he went on to say, quote, The South is kept crushed under Negro rule. I can never consent to go to New Orleans and break my heart witnessing the rule of the N-words, the Negroes, and the carpetbaggers. See, I don't know what that actually is. Like, is that a... Are they, like, Mexicans or something? Or is that other people? Jews, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. Who, who are carpetbaggers? What is a carpetbagger? We will search for that. I'm sorry, I will get back to this and I'll stop interrupting with my shit. Uh, but I really don't... Is that... 
the United States history, a carpetbagger was a northerner who moved south after the American Civil War during the Reconstruction era. Fair enough. And there's a funny little like propaganda drawing of one here. So it's all in good fun. They were probably tarred and feathered and chopped up. Um, yeah, the Negro rule, blah, blah, blah. Nothing is so abhorrent to me as radicalism, which seeks to elevate the populace into the governing class. And that, indeed, is the sympathy of all those who call themselves illumined. You see, we are all nothing but cattle, stupid animals, and they are the ones who really, truly have matured. They are the ones who really do have these mature minds, and thus, they are the only ones with the right to rule. This is what they think. Ah. So the Ku Klux Klan, and none of you will have been taught this, but it is the truth. The Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, was founded in Tennessee in the late 1860s by the Southern Scottish Right leadership under Albert Pike. Again. The KKK drew its membership from the pre-Civil War, remember, remember, Knights of the Golden Circle. Due to P. Benjamin's early role in sponsoring and protecting both the Knights of the Golden Circle and the KKK offers a crucial insight into the Bene Berith's ADL's later role in fostering the revival of the KKK and the post-war World War II period. We shall return to that sordid tale some other time, but um, there's just too much to get through today. Um, another Rothschilds and Benebrith ally who enjoyed the pol political patronage of the arch-confederate John Slidell August Belmont uh, was J Judah Benjamin, his north counterpart. A private secretary to the British House of Rothschilds who arrived in New York City from London in 1837, Belmont rose to the chairmanship of the Democratic Party. A position he held for 20 years. Bel Belmont was a leading advocate of free trade and states' rights, both cornerstones of the British reconquest scheme. Prior to his emergence as a leading figure in the National Democratic Party, Belmont worked closely with the Charleston, South Carolina, Bene Berith in form, uh, fomenting radicalism among American youth. The effort was, in this case, run directly by the Mother Lodge of the Scottish Rite of England, then under the command of Britain's Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston. At Belmont's behest, Charleston's Benebrith leader, Edwin De Leon, wrote a pamphlet in the early 1850s. They did a lot of pamphlet writing back in them days wrote a pamphlet in the early 1850s entitled The Position and Duties of Young Americans. De Leon, whose family were slave traders, Bene Brith founders and later leading confederates, peddled free trade and openly advocated a strong Anglo-American alliance. Well, well. While by today's standards, the appeal for a strong Anglo-American alliance may seem uh, palatable to some. Back in the middle of the 19th century, this was borderline treason. Ladies and gentlemen, the phone is ringing off the wall as the fanatics try to get through to deny this. <laughs> but it is the truth. The original research was done by the Executive Intelligence Review CAGI was duplicated in the research down to the T to make sure that this material is true. Um, it is absolutely 100% legitimate and historical truth from beginning to end. And that's why the ADL and the B'nai B'rith has never sued the Executive Intelligence Review over the report that we're going over. Or that this is drawn from, rather. The more accurate way of saying it okay so this stuff is fact it's all there for you to look at 
all of these people in all of these secret societies don't deny any of the even the most absurd claims against them they don't deny them but nobody reads the books it's the same as uh, like when you're Richard Dawkins right now I don't have one particular opinion on this one way or another the atheist versus Christian thing or atheist just versus religious thing but Richard Dawkins and it is obvious over and over again has never does not know the Bible like if he is going to be such like if he is going to take this position as being a, a like a, a leading member in the atheist community which I think he does then you should you should know it as good as any Christian right but he doesn't he never seems he always seems to misquote it when you see him in uh, debates or anything like that he you know if he if he's just talking on his own he can sound pretty good about it because nobody else has read it either <laughs> I don't think I've ever met an atheist that has read the Bible. Like beyond, everyone knows certain stories or knows like the gist, you know, the gist. But uh, anyway, I don't know how I got into that. Again, this isn't my other podcast. I need to just shut up and uh, get on just talking about this, shall we? So Belmont's young American uh, American members, sorry, were among the draft rioters and radical ab- abolitionists, if that is a word, um, who disrupted Lincoln's Union War mobilization, and um, which of course was to the benefit of the Confederacy and England. During the early phase of the Civil War, England tried repeatedly to intervene into the conflict with ceasefire plans that would have ensured the permanent dissolution of the Union. Now this is very interesting. They tried... You know, it instantly they go into propaganda mode, probably where they're like, "This war needs to stop. People need to stop killing themselves." It is obvious you two have problems. Separate, because then they'd instantly have half that country and some two fronts to fight them on in an actual physical war. This is all it is. Constantly, it's a, it's just a game. It's just a big grand game. Grand chess game that, they, and these are the undefeated chess champions <laughs> for over like probably over five to ten thousand years. It's unbelievable. Unfortunately, it is quite unbelievable, but uh, it is the truth. During um, the Civil War itself, while many American Jews sided with the North. Make sure you understand this, folks, so you know that this is not racist or uh, anti-Semitic thing, uh, a program, or or an anti-Semitic report. The majority of American Jews sided with the North and fought uh, valiantly to preserve the Union. The B'nai B'rith was predominantly pro-Confederate. Even in New York City, the lodges preached secession. The Baltimore Hebrew Congregation, founded by Dutch Jews who made their money in the slave trade, heard sermons by Rabbi Morris Raphael and the following. And he said this quote, Who can blame our brethren of the South for their being inclined to secede from a society under whose government their ends cannot be attained? and whose union is kept together by heavy iron ties of violence and arbitrary violence. Who can blame our brethren of the South for seceding from a society whose government cannot and will not protect property rights and privileges of a great portion of the Union? End quote. Following the Civil War and the assassination of Lincoln, many of the Jewish slave and cotton traders from the south typified by the Lehman brothers moved to New York City and became prominent in Wall Street banking and stock brokerages. With the defeat of President Lincoln's reconstruction program following his assassination President Andrew Johnston uh, sorry Andrew Johnson um, added a T in there myself Pardon the Scottish Rite insurrectionists. Now listen to this closely. President Andrew Johnson pardoned the Scottish Rite insurrectionists, including Albert Pike 
and accepted a th rank of 32nd degree in the Southern Jurisdiction Freemasons. Okay? I'm going to say that all again. President... President Andrew Johnson pardoned the Scottish right insurrectionists, including Albert Pike, and, the, and accepted a rank of 32nd degree in the Southern Jurisdiction Freemasons. That was his reward. Suspected Lincoln assassination plotter Simon Wolfe was also absolved of any criminal culpability for his wartime activities. Only non-Freemasons and non benea Brith were prosecuted for their crimes they committed in the Civil War. The legacy of British Freemasonic treachery against the Union survived intact, including the benea Brith. Although the slave trade uh, nominally was banned in the United States as a result of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, a new form of slavery had already been launched by the British East India Company and its Scottish Rite directors, including the same Lord uh, Palmerston who had played such a pivotal role in the secessionist insurrection. The new form of slavery was drugs, opium. Henry Carey of the architects, sorry, one of the architects of the um, Abraham Lincoln's reconstruction program and a leading proponent, proponent of the American system of political economy warned about Britain's opium war against China and India in his 1853 book The Slave Trade, Domestic and Foreign. Get that book and read that book. He described the trade in uh, as such, quote, that pernicious drug opium, as quote, one perfect free trade, one of perfect free trade, Defeated in the secessionist uh, insurrection plot, Britain and its fifth column of agents in both North and South, uh, North and the South would eventually regroup around the strategy of running an opium war against the United States. As the reader will learn in later chapters, the Bene Brith and the Anti-Defamation League's secret lodge played a central role in the drugging of America. Well, let's fast forward all the way to 1992. In the nation's capital where Bene Brith lawyer Simon Wolfe conspired on behalf of the southern... Um, on, on behalf of the southern, slave trade, uh, the southern slave trade. The streets in many parts of the town are dominated now by drug traffickers whose deadly poison uh, had inflicted both a uh, subculture and addiction of violence and a spreading of AIDS among a predominantly black population. Community-based efforts led by the Nation of Islam have begun, uh, have begun to roll back that new subculture of slavery and despair, restoring safety and dignity to some of the most desperately poor neighbourhoods in the United States. This was from a long time ago. We were talking about 1992 here, everybody, before um, the Nation of Islam itself was infiltrated um, and now just serves as just more insanity and false history. True to its history, the Bene Brith ADL intercedes to turn back the clock to the days of slavery, for drug addiction is a form of um, slavery. And those who are addicted are subject to the whims of those who have enslaved them. They can even control which way society goes, ladies and gentlemen. You see, if they want to create more crime in order to take rights away from the people, indeed to make people scream to have their rights taken away in order to take their fear away, get the crime and the drugs off our streets. 
they just elevate the price of the drug so that the poor addict cannot afford to pay for them. So he has to go out and steal and rob and mug somebody and even kill to satisfy the terrible craving of his flesh. You never thought of it that way, did you? But it's true. Um, one of these days you'll begin to understand how we've all been enslaved for most of our lives, all of us. Caucasian, Jew, Black, Indian, Orient, it doesn't matter, it doesn't make any difference. We've all been lied to, we've all been deceived, we've all been manipulated. And we've all been puppets on the end of somebody's strings. It is the purpose of this broadcast, I guess, and Bill Cooper's work to stop that. Or at the very least, expose it. I'm not so foolish to think that we're going to be successful and stop it all, but we may be able to stop most of it, and we may be able to stop, may be able to hang those that are responsible by their neck from lampposts until they're dead, once they've been legally apprehended and tried by a jury of their peers, once the truth is known. But the Illuminati, ladies and gentlemen, not the Jews, is in control of the judicial uh, system. The Illuminati, um, Freemasons, sit on the benches of every court in uh, this nation, and most nations. First, ladies and gentlemen, when this happened, the ADL set off a massive wave of anger and resentment in the African American community, when in June 1992 it published The Anti-Semitism of Black Demagogues and Extremists. The widely circulated ADL report is a frontal attack on the Nation of Islam and its leader, Minister um, whoa, Louis uh, Farrakhan. Farrakhan is somebody who is just a loudmouth right now. It openly threatens to uh, retribute against any elected official or political activist who associates with or politically commend the nation of Islam. I've, co I've commended them many times on the Hour of Time. That's uh, the Bill Cooper podcast. Bill Cooper radio show. Bill Cooper's commended the um, nation of Islam. And I would to an extent uh, continue that. I condemn, the, condemn them for their racism, but I applaud them and admire them for what they've done for the black community. No one else has done so much to bring them up out of poverty and give them a sense of self-worth, bring their families together and where they stay together. No one else has taken the drugs off the streets like the Nation of Islam. In July 1992, a major uproar developed in Washington, D.C. when the ADL, ladies and gentlemen, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League of Benea Brith, was caught red-handed in an ugly attempt to shut down any government contact with what has been the only effective effort to clean up drugs and crime in, uh, the drug and crime-infested areas in the nation's capital. The Nation of Islam, now famous, dope busters. If you've Investigate what happened in Waco, Texas, ladies and gentlemen. You always run up against the ADL and the Bene Brith. They instigated it. They brought it into being. They promoted it. They pressed it. And they are the ones who released the lies to the press around the country that kept the American people in the dark. The Washington, D.C. Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly issued an official proclamation honoring Nation of Islam leader Dr. Abdul Alim Muhammad for his leadership in the Dope Busters campaign and for his groundbreaking work in treating AIDS patients with immunoviron, an African developed anti AIDS drug. The ADL went absolutely insane. They had ignored these people until they began to take drugs off the streets. Make sure you understand that. Kelly was repeatedly hit with ADL organized delegations demanding that the pro, uh, proclamation be res, uh, rescinded lest she too be identified 
as an anti-Semite. And this is how they blackmail leaders and police chiefs and mayors and military officers in doing their bidding for fear of being labelled anti-Semitic. You've learned all you can all you can about these people. These people are horrific. They're the worst racists. They are enslavers of people. That's what they do. It's what they've always done. It's where they come from. When she refused, the ADL engaged in a national barrage of media attacks against the Nation of Islam. The attacks uh, cul uh, cu Sorry, um, got to stop this. Knock at the door. And we're back. Uh, where are we? Uh, when she refused, the ATL engaged in a national barrage of media attacks against the Nation of Islam. The attacks culminated in an attack run, in, sorry, in an article run in the Washington Times, co-authored by ADL National Director Abe Foxman and Fact-Finding Director Mira Lanxi Bolland. Ultimately, Kelly succumbed to ADL demands and issued an open letter to the community in which she continued to praise Dr. Muhammad's work against drugs, violence, and AIDS, but contemned alleged anti-Semitic statements attributed to him by the ADL. You see how it works, folks? She can't, she came in because she was afraid she wouldn't be re-elected mayor in her next election. And she lost. I think a lot of people's respect. She probably lost a lot of people's respect, um, including Bill Cooper. But she doesn't care. Her political career was safe. And that's eventually, that's how they get you. The ultimate selfishness of humans. Um, what was really at the heart of the Washington Times article? Which was otherwise just a, a bunch, a collection of outrageous and unsubstantiated charges against the nation of Islam. Was a demand that Congress defeat the major appropriations bill for the Department of Housing and Urban Development over the question of whether HU, uh, HUD rules should permit a HUD contractor to hire the thought busters and provide security for a federally subsidized housing project in Los Angeles. The ADL was particularly upset about their national attention the successful thought busters drug eradication program was getting. The Dope Busters were funded, uh, founded in Washington, D.C. in 1988. Since then, unarmed Dope Buster patrols have been able to eradicate uh, drug trafficking in the streets uh, and at the street level in nine Washington ghetto neighborhoods and private housing projects completely and totally disrupting the plans of the Illuminati to control those people. Again, unfortunately, in the modern day, this isn't 1992 anymore, they have a black president that is used to manipulate a vast majority of them into just these brainless people who are fucking high as fuck constantly, I know that's ironic coming from me, I'm high as fuck constantly, just out, um, grow up, broken families, um, no prospects, uh, hating, the, the, hating the authority that like uh, other people, like police, and um, you know, basically completely divided and controlled and think everything is racist and everything is, everybody should be kicked off and fired for saying things. They are just, they are a tool now of the Illuminati. Um, yeah, so, the Nation of Islam did that, did all that, they did it with no deaths and very, very little violence. Exemplary, exemplary sorry, of the excess of the program is that Mayfair Mansions housing uh, complex in the northeast Washington, Mayfair Mansions, went from ugly, unsafe, open-air drug market in the 1988 to being a handsomely restored, safe, vibrant community as a result at the time. 
of the Thoughtbuster patrols. When Hood Secretary um, Jack Kemp visited Mayfair Mansions earlier this year, he admitted that the earlier this year, which would have been 1992, he admitted that the Nation of Islam's Thoughtbusters deserved the credit and indicated that he was open to granting the patrols federal government contracts. Actually, it wasn't this year, ladies and gentlemen. It was 1992, like I said. Um, so the tenants in public uh, and private housing projects from New York to Baltimore to Los Angeles uh, are demanding dope buster patrols, or were demanding dope buster patrols. In most cases, the idea has the support of the local police and government agencies who had failed to find any other efficient, uh, effective way to curtail the intensifying patterns of drug trafficking and violence. In almost every case, the ADL has attempted to block the tenant's choice of security force. The tenant leaders who refuse to back down have been subjected to threats, harassment, break-ins, and other forms of intimidation. This time, however, the ADL may have committed a fatal error in launching such an open and vicious attack on the Nation of Islam. Dr. Abdul Alim Muhammad is not the only leader of the Nation of Islam. He's one of the most respected community leaders in um, the Washington area. And his pioneering work against AIDS uh, got him, gained him a lot of international recognition. Um, the black and Hispanic communities in the United States are disproportionately infected by the deadly virus, but have had almost no access to the accepted treatments, which consist of uh, prohibitively expensive and highly toxic AZT, DDI, or DDC at the time. Um, and... As we have revealed in this program, those drugs may really be the cause of um, AIDS patients. Dr. Muhammad and New York physician Dr. Barbara Justice, what a name, Dr. Bra Barbara Justice, have reported dramatic success in treating more than 600 patients who have who are HIV positive with the immunoviron, the drug they brought back from Kenya. Similarly, the ADL's charges against the dope busters carry little credibility and leave the ADL completely exposed as nothing more than a protection racket for the drug cartel. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the truth. The dope busters enjoy the intense support of the communities they serve and have, unprecedented, uh, have an unprecedented record of success. Wherever they go, the dope busters convey an unmistakable message of hope and inspiration to the community that the war on drugs can be won. We know it probably cannot now. Interviews with the residents of these communities saved by the dope busters make clear they believe that the message, and nothing else, that has made the Nation of Islam and the dope busters a target of ADL attacks in a community where the twin uh, plagues of drug addiction and AIDS are the most visible vestiges of slavery, the ADL has shown that despite the passage of time, its true loyalties lie with the slave masters. Now, in 18, uh, 1985, the ADL proudly gave its Torch of Liberty Award to the Las Vegas businessman, Morris Barney Dalitz. Now you don't know who that is, do you? The award ceremony, a strictly black tie event, was given front page attention at the league's monthly bulletin, which praised Dalit as a great philanthropist who had donated generously to the ADL over the years. Dalit generously was motivated by a lot more than an impulse to help out a favourite charity. As one of the most important figures in the organised in organised crime over a period of sixty years and as a lifetime right-hand man to organised crime's 20th century chairman of the board, um, Mayor Lansky, Moore Ballots was well aware that, uh, of the fact that the Anti-Defamation League was, from its founding, a powerful secret arm of the Illuminati, the go between, uh, between the National Crime Syndicate and the respected arms of the secret organisation that is out to control the world. 
Without the ADL's undaunted public relations work on behalf of organized crime, the United States would have never been flooded with illegal drugs and gangsters like Dalits and Lansky. Would have long ago, um, people like them would have long ago been carted off and put into prison and died. Dalits was one of the kingpins of the Prohibition era, bootleg in business, and he, along with three other gangsters, Morris Kleinman, Sam Tucker, and Louis uh, Rothkoff, ran the Cleveland Underworld, their self-described Jewish Navy, smuggled rot-gut rot -gut whiskey across the Great Lakes from Canada into the Midwest United States. Now, don't get all carried away with the term Jewish Navy because the Irish gangsters called themselves the Irish, whatever they were called, it's human nature. On the Canadian side of the lakes, the booze was manufactured by the Brofman gang, led by Sam and Abe Brofman, second generation Romanian immigrants, whose father had been taught, uh, had been brought over to Canada by the Bene Brith, ally Baron uh, de Heshfund, and had set up a string of whorehouses. Sam and Abe used the pure, their pure drug company, which was established with the help of Hudson Bay Company, to manufacture illegal whiskey, du whiskey during the Canadian Prohibition, which was uh, 1915 to 1919. When Canada legalized booze after learning their lesson, the United States instituted its ban a year later, not having learned anything. They were all ready to become the major suppliers to the gangsters south of the border. United States government documents, these are government documents, from the Prohibition era claimed that over 34,000 Americans died of alcohol poisoning, uh, drinking the Brofman brew, not from drinking alcohol forks, but from drinking this specific brew, it was poison. Today, Sam Brofman's son, Edgar, is a national commissioner of the ADL and the head of its powerful New York appeal and we'll pick uh, the, his trail up later for he's dirty too. Again, this was from a few years ago. Following Prohibition, more Dalits became the undisputed crime boss of Cleveland, expanding his criminal operations, gambling, labor, racketeering, money laundering, tax evasion from Hollywood and Las Vegas all the way to Miami. One of his Miami investments, a night spot called the Frolic Club, was a joint venture with Mayor Lansky. When Lansky moved into Cuba to open his first offshore gambling, narcotics and money laundering haven, Dalitz was brought in as a privileged partner. When Lansky and the other directors of the National Crime Syndicate decided that his longtime partner Benjamin Bugsy Sigel had become a liability and had to be assassinated. It was Dalit who assumed the lion's share of Sigel's Las Vegas uh, casino interest. Um, interests he still holds, ladies and gentlemen, today. Lansky and Sigel had formed the original Murder Inc., otherwise known as Mayer and Bugsy, uh, the Mayer and Bugsy Gang, to enforce the creation of a national crime syndicate overseeing the Prohibition era, illegal liquor and narcotics traffic. From the very outset, Dalits uh, had been a member of the National Commissioner, Commission of Crime Syndicate. Up until Lansky's death in 1983, Dalits was a regular visitor to the crime boss's Miami Beach condo and was widely presumed by law enforcement officials to be one of the primary heirs to the Lansky crime empire. Now just two years after Lansky's death, Dalitz was publicly serviced, uh, surfaced as an ADL philanthropist, um, this was a sign of course of the times. By the beginning of the 1980s decade of greed, drug money, narco dealers had already replaced petrol dollars as the primary source of liquid uh, liquidity to fuel the stock market and real estate speculative bubbles facilitated by the Charter, uh, the, sorry, the Carter and Reagan administration's deregulation of the banking, savings and loan and brokerage industries. And we all now know these days what that led to. You saw it. It was a giant heist from the beginning. Do you, is this, is any of this trying, if this isn't starting to get into your head yet, go back and listen to it again and start to rec remember the names that I'm saying and how they're intertwined and how they took over. It's just a giant fucking plan. 
while you're at work all day, this is what they're doing. As the power of drug money grew, so too did political and financial clout and the political and financial clout of the ADL. Junk bond swindlers like Ivan Bowski and Michael Milken and dope bankers like Edmund Safra, not to mention more Dalits, regularly poured millions into the ADL war chest. In return for this, uh, this gift, I guess, the ADL publicly branded anybody who challenged the clout of the organized crime as a dyed-in-wool anti-Semite. You'll remember that. It wasn't just the ADL either. It was the Italian equivalents. All, all the way through all the mafia, all that so-called mafia stuff, which of course was just a wing of the Illuminati. All of it. You accuse Jews of it, you were being anti-Semitic, the Jewish mafias. You accuse the Italians, you were being anti-Italian. Racists. That's how they do it, that's how they've always done it. The lionizing of mobster Dalits was the ADL's way of boasting that their public relations work over a 70 year period had paid off. But things were not always so easy. You see, the ADL had been funded shortly after the turn of the century as a Jewish defense arm of the Bene B'rith, a nominally Jewish secret society sponsored and controlled by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, with its headquarters in the Temple of the Supreme Council of Southern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, just 13 blocks from the White House in Washington, D.C., and by some of the leading British and American white Anglo-Saxon Protestant families, including the Bush family. B'nai B'rith's Washington DC representative, Simon Wolfe, the man whom Lincoln's Secret Service Chief uh, Lafayette C. Baker had arrested as a Confederate spy and Union blockade runner during the Civil War, was now working closely with President Theodore Roosevelt in mobilizing Jewish American support to overthrow the Russian Tsar. Now are you beginning to see how this... Are you, are you seeing it? Are you seeing how you know about all this history all independently, but you never hear about the interaction between these people? Behind the scenes. Which caused the fall of empires. While you're at work. Bloop! 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 At a supermarket. Bloop! Bloop. Oh, that's fine. What's, what's Mary doing at night? This is what's happening. According to Wolf's 1918 autobiography, he had met secretly with President Roosevelt at his Sagmore Hills estate in New York and had launched an international drive to brand the Tsarist regime as anti-Semitic. Again. After a series of meetings and correspondence with Russian, Russia's Prime Minister, Count Sergei Witt, arranged by Roosevelt, Wolf had denounced the Russian regime for reneging on its promise to curb anti-Jewish pro, uh, pogroms, after which American Jewish organizations, led from behind the scenes by the Bene B'rith, began funneling guns to the anti-Tsarist insurrectionists. You know they want their socialist world order? What happened to Russia after the Tsars fell? Just ask yourself that and you, you get where we go what's inevitably we're going to get to. What sort of ideology did they turn to? Was it a right-wing one? <laughs> Thus, B'nai B'rith played an active role in the Russian Revolution of 1905 and the formation of the Soviet Union. This activity would lead to the widespread allegations that prominent American Jews were pro-Bolshevik. Uh, the Warburg family of Kunlob and company did fund, did fund, it is a matter of record, Lenin and Leon Trotsky. They did fund them, the Warburg family of Kunlob and company. And father and son, Bolshevik agents, Julius and Arman Hammer, who helped fund the United States Communist Party, did actively spread the Bolshevik cause in America and spent a decade in the Soviet Union following the 1917 un uh, revolution.
these allegations of pro-communist sentiment, while grounded in well-publicised scandalous action by prominent Jewish families, missed the mark. In fact, the plot to bring down the Tsar and install the Bolshevik in power in Russia served a long-standing Illuminati and geopolitical interest of the sort advanced by the Scottish right. And Britain feared the development of a Eurasian alliance among France, Germany, Russia, Japan and China based on economic cooperation and facilitated by, building, by the building of a transcontinental system of railroads linking the east to the west. Such a transcontinental railroad system would render Britain's domination over <coughs> the seas <coughs> relatively unimportant. And I think right there, as my throat does actually begin to give in, uh, this is probably a good part to a good time to end this episode. And um, we'll pick it up exactly where we left off uh, last time. I hope you learned something. This has been the first episode. Shabby, I know. I know I need to cut down on my ums, ums, and getting distracted while I'm reading. But uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, okay. And I just did the uh again. Did, uh, 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 I'll get them in now. Uh, 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 uh. I listened over to one of my... Po I, it drove me fucking crazy. I couldn't believe how terrible I am at speaking. Well, I'm the best you've got. So until next time... Uh, this has been the Mystery School Podcast, the first ever episode. Laters. <laughs>